The case study for this week's lab is about the discovery of dark energy, the discovery that won uh, my colleague Brian Schmidt his Nobel Prize, and we're actually going to use some of his data. Now, it's been known for about 90 years that space is expanding. Every bit of space is getting bigger. So if you get some bit of space here, it's growing, not by very much, by about 10 to the minus 18 of a meter per second. This doesn't actually make you and me bigger. In principle, a person is growing because the space between all the atoms in their body is getting larger, and so at this rather small rate, we should be getting this bigger. In practice, it doesn't happen because the atoms here are bounded, bonded to the chemical, chemically to the atoms here and here and here and here all the way up. So all the chemical bonds along the length means that while space expands, it pulls you back into strength. Likewise, the Earth is orbiting around the Sun, and we're not being carried away further because we're gravitationally bound. But if you look at something really far away, like our galaxy, the Milky Way, and another galaxy that's millions of light years away, there is nothing binding them together, so the space between them really does expand. And that's how we know space is expanding. Here is a simulation of this expanding universe. Each sphere is a galaxy. You can see they extend forever, and they're all moving apart from each other. There was no one blast wave coming out from a particular point. It's just a universe that's always been infinite, becoming bigger and bigger, a bigger and bigger form of infinity. What we actually see is, let's say, a photon of light sets up from this galaxy here, moving towards us. It's got a particular wavelength, lambda. And these wavelengths will be set by the atoms in this galaxy. A typical galaxy spectrum has particular absorption lines or emission lines due to different elements, and they all occur at well-known lab wavelengths. So let's say we're looking at one of the spectral lines, and it's got a wavelength lambda naught. As it flies through space, space expands. And so by the time it reaches us, the waves have been stretched. So it's coming out at a new wavelength, call it lambda, which is bigger than lambda naught. And what this is telling us is how much the universe has grown while the photon has been travelling. So the photon's been travelling at some time t, it's gone from lambda to lambda naught, that's telling us how much the universe has expanded since then. We can take a spectrum here, and we'll see the same lines, but now they're a different wavelength, and we can look at the shift, because we know what wavelength the same element produces in the laboratory, lambda naught, and we define a redshift, which is written as z, the redshift, equals lambda minus lambda naught over lambda naught. So if, for example, um, we know something has a lambda naught of 500 nanometers, and we observe it at, uh, observed wavelength is 550 nanometers, then the redshift is 550 minus 500 over 500, which is 0.1. What does that mean? It means that while this photon has been traveling, space is expanded by a factor of 0.1, by 10%. So space is now 10% larger than it was when the photon set out. So any distance back then is going to be the distance now all over 1 plus red, the redshift. So that's telling us that space is getting bigger. If you find something with a redshift of 0.5, that means the universe was 1.5 times smaller when it was emitted, and so on. Now, we believe that the universe started off expanding very fast. So if you plot the size of some length of the universe, size against time, the universe had a big bang and started off expanding very fast. But then we've got gravity, and as these galaxies fly apart from each other, gravity's going to pull them back. Now, gravity sucks. It only attracts things, so it's only ever going to slow the expansion down. So expect the expansion rate to slow down. We can't really see this. What we can observe is the size of the universe and the time back from the present. So at the moment, we know the size of the universe today, and we know that it's getting smaller into the past. And so if we look further and further back in time, we should see a curve which tells us how rapidly space has been slowing down. 
And this is very interesting, because if space is slowing down a lot, then eventually it'll stop expanding and come back together again. So we have a big bang here. We are about there. Space is expanding. But if it's slowing down quite fast, it will eventually stop expanding, reach a maximum size, and then come together again in a big explosion, which is known either as the Big Crunch or the Ganab Gib. Ganab Gib being Big Bang spelled backwards. If, on the other hand, it's not slowing down so much, it will keep on expanding forever, but at an ever-decreasing rate. Like throwing a ball up that reaches escape velocity. So this was a big debate in cosmology back in the 1990s. Which of these two curves are we actually on? And what people were trying to do is look back in time and see how much this curve was curving, the curve of size against time, and extrapolate forward to see would the universe last forever or end in a big crunch. The way this is measured is look at supernovae, a particular type 1a supernova. A type 1a supernova happens when two white dwarf stars collide with each other. Well, that's one theory. Another theory is that you get one white dwarf star with a red giant star nearby that's dumping gas onto it. We don't really know, but what happens is the white dwarf star eventually becomes too big and explodes, uh, has, undergoes nuclear fusion in one massive burst and explodes. And these things all have the same luminosity. They're all the same real brightness. Because they've all got the same real brightness, if we measure how bright something appears to be, we know how bright it really is, and therefore we can work out how far away it must be to pe appear as faint as it actually is. So what people did was they found a whole bunch of supernovae at different distances. As they're at different distances, that means you've got a different time the light has been travelling. So you've got different times for each supernovae. And you can measure the redshift using the spectrum. And that will tell you the size of the universe. And so you can get a plot of size of universe versus time and see what's happening. And that's what you're going to do in the lab this week.